Welcome to the Beefcake Podcast, episode number 29. My name is Wilson Horrell, and my co-host is Mr. Vaughn Rawls. We have a special guest with us today, and that is Brian Swanson. Hey, Brian, how you doing? I'm good. Where, where can you be found, Brian? Are you, are you Brian at Thirsty Runner? I am at Thirsty Runner on Twitter and Instagram. Where else do you need to find me? I don't do the Snapchats. What's your address? My address? Oh, my email address? You want me to give it to the <laughs> no, world? What's your, ad- what's, your, what's your private property address? What's your gate code? I'm at 201 Poplar. Go get a checkbook and give me the nine-digit number <laughs> that's in the middle of the... <laughs> Vaughn, what are you doing? You still with us? <laughs> Man, I had, a, I, <laughs> I had a laughing attack. Sorry. <laughs> well, you you like, give me your that. address. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, that's a weird question to ask our guest. I know. I, I, I get live? nervous, man. I get nervous. I'm learning. You know how hard it is for me to start this this thing? There's a lot of pressure. When you have millions of listeners like you do, there there's yeah. a lot of pre- pre- pressure to perform and, you know, be at uh, at the top of your game all the time. Yeah, you definitely don't want to lose any of our followers. I mean, we have so many that hi mom losing losing followers <laughs> is, n- is not an option we have to to make sure we are on top of our game we have millions of potential followers billions if you include china <laughs> all right so we're going to do we're going to do a podcast today on the art of the mic drop boom goes the dynamite the art of the mic drop i had an experience last week where we went to uh, the name of the place is South Main Sounds, which is in downtown Memphis. A gentleman there named Mark Parcells owns it. It's an abandoned art gallery, and he turned it into a, a studio of sorts. And so he has a singer-songwriter night where they'll have about eight songwriters, and it's, it's a very intimate setting. People listen and enjoy the music. It's not loud, and, and people pay attention to it. And he's actually doing a documentary that he's putting together for – a YouTube show and it's there's a lot of talent in there as we know Memphis has a great deal of talent it's just sometimes hard to to find the right atmosphere to allow them to perform anyways Amanda and myself and the kids went to hear my brother play my brother Ted Horrell has been playing music for a long long time probably since he was I don't know 11 12 years old Amanda had never heard him play live and I have I haven't heard him play in that sort of atmosphere since I've been sober. So it was really a special experience for me to be able to take it all in. And when we went down there, as he was getting ready to play, I became more and more excited and energized. And it was hard for me to bite my tongue because I I wanted to, to really pump Amanda up and let her know, you know, how talented he really is and how good he was really going to sound. And, you know, I I just kind of sat back and, and let that build and waited for him to get up there and take the stage. And he did exactly what I knew he was going to do. And he just, he nailed it. He killed it. It it was a great show and it was a great moment for me. And I was very, very proud of my brother and very, very proud of, of the work that he's put into that. You know, it was nice to sit back and have that confidence and comfort to know that what he was about to do was going to be a mic drop moment. I knew he was about to get on there and, and tear it up. As I was sitting there waiting for him to to nail the performance, I couldn't help but think of what goes into that mic drop and how many mics have been knocked over and how many chords have been tripped over and how many amplifiers have broken and how many crowds he's played in front of that didn't care anything about what he was doing, about how many audience he's played in front of that would rather be watching the football game and about how many embarrassing and uncomfortable moments went into having a a moment like this and I started thinking that you know in order to have a mic drop moment you got to go through a lot of a lot of uncomfortable mic knocking over moments before you can earn that and Vaughn you probably know as good as anybody being that you've played in a band oh man let me tell you let me tell you uh one time uh we played at TJ Mulligan's uh <clears throat> And this is like a, just a bar with, you know, bar food or whatever, like an Irish bar. And, uh, we played on a night that was like the biggest UT football game ever. 
<laughs> and, and we started playing. We started playing like right when the game started, and it was it was so bad. People were like, "Shut up! What are you doing?" <laughs> it got so bad that like the manager of the bar came over and was like. Okay, guys, I'm just going to have to ask you to stop and leave because nobody wants to hear you play and you're interrupting the football oh, game. Oh, wow. <laughs> like, so, so we just had to tear all our stuff down and leave. Wow. Oh, man. As long as you yeah, still pay me. That, no, well, <laughs> that didn't happen either. But, uh, <clears throat> yeah, so I immediately thought of that night when you said that. It, it definitely is that way. I've, I've got several friends that are musicians and uh, – it's always disappointing when I go out, uh, you know, and they, they play in bars and, you know, there's just so many people in the room that that person singing and playing and, and doing their craft of choice and living that dream is just background noise to so many of the people that are there. You know, it, uh, it's disappointing, you know, it's like, um, if you guys would just turn around and like look at this amazing person singing up here and how awesome of a job they're doing and they've wrote this music, this beautiful music and and you guys are just missing it because you'd rather talk about, you know, the latest TV show or politics or whatever else is, you know, current at the time. It's just always disappointing to me. It's one thing if you're like just like a, a party band playing like Prince songs or whatever, but like, <laughs> if the, and when it's a band that's like actually writing songs and playing original music, and like everybody's just interested in drinking as much as possible and fighting, it's that's where sad. I've spent most of my time is being the the loud guy that wishes the band would shut up. You know how how arrogant <laughs> is that? As if I'm the talent they came to see. <laughs> And so being on the other side of it. How can I have the spotlight if you guys keep singing? You don't even have to pay me. I'm just going to keep talking. And that's where the the rush came from seeing it on the different side and and understanding that even somebody like me who was totally on the other side of that will come around and I'll have that moment where I'll pay attention. You know, so no matter the, the, the people that do things like this, the people that perform the people that are willing to step outside of their comfort zone, whether it's music, whether it's CrossFit, whether it's ballet competitions, whether it's band competitions, whether it's, you know, recitals, whatever it is, there will come a time when you have that moment where people will be captivated by what you're doing. You'll have the opportunity to drop that mic, to do what you do and put that on display and, have everyone understand what it is that, that you've been doing and why you work so hard at, at what you're working hard at. Have you had a mic drop moment, Wilson? I don't know that I can think of a specific mic drop moment. I, I thought about this when, when I, while I was writing it, and I don't know that I've had a specific mic drop moment in the public setting, but I've had so many personally. You know, where I've been able to finish up and sure. say, that's all there is. You know, finishing the, 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 the Tunnel Hill 50 miler. Uh, finishing Sillimore my first year. Finishing Sillimore my second year. You know, the, the things that I've, I've completed workouts in CrossFit where people were watching and cheering and I felt like I can just drop the weights and there's nothing else to be said. Those are pretty big mic drop moments. Yeah, you're right. They, they are. I, I guess honest. probably I, I was saying that <laughs> I was trying to be humble, but more insecure and in that I didn't want to label those as a mic drop moment, but absolutely there they are. Yes. And I think more importantly, sure. I align myself in positions that will allow me to drop that mic at some point. And that was the point of the article is that if you're not doing something that can potentially lead to a mic drop moment, get busy doing something. Yeah, I think that's pretty profound. Get busy living or get that's busy right. dying, right? But I was I was thinking more along the lines of like, how do you get yourself into those situations? What can you do to make sure that you are in a position to drop the mic? Well, I think that looking at the end result first helps. I have visions of grandeur. <clears throat> Whenever I start doing something, I see it as being big. And now those things most of the time don't pan out. And that's all well and good. But I think that sometimes it's it's beneficial to play the tape through and see the potential of what it is that you're doing. 
even if it's exaggerated and highly unlikely, it's still fun to, to imagine that and put that carrot in front of your face and start working towards it. Yeah. There's, you know, there's a lot to be said for, uh, you know, reaching for that unattainable goal because, you know, if you train or practice or whatever the appropriate term is before you try and accomplish that goal, you're still probably going to end up far from where you were, where you were. There's a lot to be said for just improving like that. Even if, even if you can't ever reach that super far reaching goal that you're originally set out for. Well, I think that what we're doing right now is an example of that. I've, I've taken to this podcasting and found that it's a hobby that I really, really enjoy. And I've also found that it's a hobby that does not come naturally to me and takes a lot of work. The downside that comes with a podcast and getting better at podcasting is that it requires getting behind a microphone and putting it out there to people. And that's scary. Yeah, I think that is probably the um, reason why uh, the other podcast that uh, I take part in involves drinking because all of us were very scared of being in front of the mic and talking and sounding like idiots. And so it's, let's take some of this liquid courage with us every single time to uh, make us better at talking. And, and I don't know that we ever actually got better at talking, but we care. Less, so. <laughs> There's a lot to be said for that. Too. <laughs> right. And I think that's a fine idea. I think that the drinking idea is, is a great idea on y'all's end. The drinking idea on, on yeah. this end would be one long, disastrous podcast. It would be like a four-month podcast <laughs> that then turned into an E! True Hollywood story. I, I've had a couple of those. There was, uh, there's was there been a couple of those nights, too, where uh, I, uh, I pre-gamed a little too much. <laughs> and uh, when it tam- came time to record, I was... Uh, almost incoherent and uh well fortunately if you have a podcast (laughs) called nerds drinking that's That's pretty funny you're you're walking into that no one's gonna say you know i sat down to enjoy a night of nerds drinking podcast and would you believe they drank and and got drunk (laughs) (laughs) and somebody drank too much damn it i don't know weird (laughs) it happens (laughs) i'm not listening to that podcast again (laughs) Mm -mm. so vaughn what is your mic drop moment What is my mic drop moment? I think that uh, I've had several of them or many of them on over time, kind of like what Wilson was saying when you were talking about running the races and accomplishing that. I feel like those those are pretty big mic drop moments and I've been fortunate to have what I feel like are a lot of those moments, not just in running. The biggest one would probably be my first 50-mile race was huge because when I cross the finish line I was literally crying I could not believe that I had just done this I was thinking just a few years ago I was watching my wife walk a half marathon and and to me that was unattainable I was like it's such an amazing thing that you've done doing a half marathon I can't believe that you've done this this is so incredible and and then fast forward uh, like I could never do anything like that. And then fast forward just a few years and I was completing a 50 mile race in, during which I had to climb over a mountain. And that like was amazing to me. And it just overcame me. That was a huge mic drop moment. Uh, but then like there are other moments in my work where I've finished projects and I feel like, boom, you know, like we just killed that. So I have those, I feel like on a regular basis. So I don't know. I'm fortunate to. Well, I think that part of the importance of the the mic drop moment is finding the mic drop moment in the moment, you know, going after it. Like you said, finishing a project and enthusiastically finishing and saying, that's it, that that's a mic drop moment. You know, Vaughn, something that I admire about you is that you go into every workout as if there's a potential mic drop moment. You, every time you get under the squat bar, it's a potential mic drop moment with the intensity that you go underneath there. And that's the way that I would like to approach everything. Yeah. For anybody that hasn't experienced Vaughn, especially during a strength workout, it's, uh, it's definitely something to be seen. I mean, you know, it's easy for 
for those of us to kind of stand back and, you know, giggle a little bit because his mental game is very strong and, you know, he's got his process of how he goes, he gets to that moment. But I, I think you're right, Wilson, like he, uh, he's very much in that moment and believing that he's about to have great success every single time. And, uh, the fact that he's able to, you know, mentally get himself prepped for that and is, uh, is awesome. So, well, that works visualizing that mic drop that's a good way to put it is is critical like i don't feel like you should even be at the gym if you don't feel like you're about to crush everything <laughs> coming at you you know and if you don't feel that way if you can't get your mind in that game then you just should just go back home so it's funny that's the way i feel about it's it. funny that you say that because i uh <clears throat> i tend to get there in a different way than that there are so many times that my mic drop, no, it's not even a mic drop. My huge accomplishment for the day is just getting my workout clothes on and getting to the gym. I'm not feeling it. I'm not into it. I uh, don't think it's going to be a good day, but then all of a sudden it's like, holy crap, I just had a PR. Holy crap, I just crushed that workout. Like, I think you and I have similar type results, in, but we get there in a different way. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, it's going to be different for everybody, but for me, it's just, I got to be a hundred percent in the game or I'm just not even going to play with it. You know, I, I remember just a couple of weeks ago when I was in a class and you were there and I was like, I don't even, I don't, I'm, I'm not even squatting today. Like it's just not happening. Right. You know, I would just, I'm just going to walk away. And you were like, so how'd you do on the squat? I was like, I didn't, I'm not here today. You know, and some days are like that, but when I have the those days I, I just roll with it and move on to the next thing yeah well brian what you said was probably as important as anything else in that you know a mic drop moment for me very much can be getting my workout clothes on and going to the gym if i want to look at it that way and i need to look at it that way because i deserve to look at it that way you deserve to see that as a real accomplishment and notice that that is the the mic drop you don't have to go further than that and say well i got my workout clothes on but i didn't pr my lift i got my workout clothes on but i didn't run the mile as fast as i wanted to run the mile why don't you just drop the mic at the point of getting your clothes on and say that's good enough for today you know maybe tomorrow i'll do a little bit better but i think that it's important to treat as many events in your life as possible as mic drop moments and I'm privileged to be around so many people who are mic droppers, you know, who are enthusiastic and who go after things and who look at whatever they can look at under as intense of a, of a microscope as possible. I think that's one of the challenges I've had for many years is accepting the mic drop moment when it happened, uh, like I'm always such a very negative self talker and very critical of myself, um, that, you know, when I do have a great accomplishment, um, I've got a million reasons why it should have been better. It could have been better. Um, just as an example, um, in a former life, I was, a a bowler, I bowled a lot. Um, and, uh, I had a 300 game once, which is a perfect game. And, um, 12 strikes in a row and I walked off the lane after every single strike shaking my head and I could have told you five or six things that were wrong with the ball that I just threw every single ball including the 12th one and people are like jumping up and down and they're congratulating me and they're telling me how awesome it is and I'm just like kicking myself. I'm like, Oh my God, you know, it went three boards to the left and it, you know, and I don't even know how that hooked back. And I just got lucky on that pin carry and blah, blah, blah. And, um, and I, I literally walked away from bowling for, uh, about six years, um, after that season, because I realized like, okay, dude, you just threw a 300 and you can't even be happy about it. So you might, you might not be enjoying this as much as you used to, but Yeah, I mean, like, if you if you have, like, it's like getting the hole-in-one in golf and, like, being pissed off that it bounced three times before it went to the cup. I mean, it's like, who cares? Like, um, 
you know, or, or the game winning shot that wasn't a swish, um, you know, that it, you know, bounced around the rim before it went in. Like, you know what I mean? Like those things are really irrelevant in, in the grand scheme of like, holy crap, you just won the game and you can't appreciate that moment. And yeah, so I was like, okay, I'm just, uh, I need to walk away from this for a while. Cause obviously I'm not, uh, not enjoying that, this. That's impactful. I've, that I've got, should. I never thought I'd get goosebumps wow. from a bowling story. Uh, but, but I have those because there is no other, a perfect game is perfect. <laughs> mm-hmm. There's no other way to look at that yet. I get where you're coming from. You take something that is perfect by definition that there's no, there's no gray area there. That is a, a black and white, perfect game. And you turn that into a problem and, and are overcritical of yourself, which I, I suffer from that. Yep. And I think that people that are going to have mic drops are the same people that are going to beat themselves up over, over 300 bowling games. And I think that it's important to have other people who, who strive for mic drops to beat you over the head with that microphone every once in a while and say, you're not looking at this right, man. You're not enjoying this and and you're just not doing it right. Yeah. I think that relates back to, to tie that into ultra running at one point I kept, I guess coming from like a, a CrossFit background where I want to PR everything uh, for the first couple of years, I was like, I got to, I, w- I really want to run this 50 mile race in 10 and a half hours. You know, I really want to do this. And every single long race was like, well, it wasn't a PR and it didn't PR, but whatever. <clears throat> then one year I just realized like, holy shit, dude, you just ran up 50 miles. It doesn't matter how long it took you to do it. Step back and think about how great of an accomplishment that is for everybody that that comes across the finish line, be it 13 hours or eight, eight, nine hours, it's still an incredible thing to have accomplished. And putting a, a PR on that is kind of silly to begin with, because the whole thing is just, it's just such an incredible experience. I'm going to get these numbers completely wrong. Talking about like the number of Americans, you know, that run marathons is like 2% of America. And I think, um, last time I looked, that comes out to like 15 or 20 million people, 15, 20 million Americans every year run a marathon. Only like 200,000 or less people run an ultra. And typically that's a 50 K. And then once you get beyond 50 K, it drops to like 10,000 people run further than a 50 K. And then like when you get to the 50 miler, it's, I mean, it's like 5,000 people a year in America that run 50 milers. So like, that's a huge accomplishment, you know, from the perspective of who cares what our time is. And, you know, it's like you're, you're among a very elite group for just finishing the distance regardless of your time. Well, and and of those, of those 5,000 people, uh, I think that probably 5,000 of those suffer from beating themselves up after accomplishing something that very few people accomplish. But it's nice to have, I I think it's good to hear from other people that you're doing it wrong, that you're not, that you're not celebrating yourself enough because there is a lot. Well, and I, I was just going to say, I think there's, I think if we try, we could find something to celebrate in every um, race or thing like that. I mean, yes, in and of itself, Oh my gosh, I just ran 50 miles. Um, yeah, it wasn't a PR, but, but also kind of what I'm thinking about is like the difference between my first 50 miler and my second 50 miler, my first 50 miler, I was wrecked for like a week after the race was over. I couldn't take off my own shoes and socks. I had to have my son take off my shoes and socks for me because I couldn't bend over to reach them. My second 50 miler, we like cracked open a beer right then and there. And I was a little sore, but I think we went out later, you know, and, uh, and hung out together. And so there's just that aspect of, um, how I feel, how much better I felt after the second 50 miler than the first 50 miler, you know, and that's an accomplishment in and of itself that I've trained my body that much better to handle that. Finding that makes life 
a lot of fun when you start the day off like that. And, and I typically do, I start the day off incredibly excited to be sober. When I wake up every morning, I'm like, Oh my God, this is so much different from the way that I used to live. And I make my bed up and I'm just, it's a mic drop moment every morning when I wake up and it doesn't take long for me to go into self-defeat mode after that. But as soon as I wake up, the first few minutes are, I, I'm dropping that mic and my, my hands are in the air. You, you remember that commercial with Jimmy Jameson, uh, the Starbucks commercial where the guy that sang Eye of the Tiger is like, Doug, 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 Doug. like everywhere he goes. <laughs> <laughs> That's my favorite commercial. Well, I think that there's, you know, living your life like that where everything's like, yeah, like I got my, I got out the door and I didn't lock myself out. Got the keys in my car. Wilson, Wilson, Wilson. Yeah. You know, that, that's a fun way. There's no reason not to live like that. You know, instead of being like, yeah, I got out the door, but you know, I'll probably get flat on the way down the road, you know, or I, I got out the door, but I should have been 10 minutes earlier. So <laughs> I guess that the question would be, where, where are you going? What are you doing? What is it that you aspire to be? How are you positioning yourself? to get to a place where you can have that mic drop moment. Because in order to do that, the price of admission is is defeat and failure and embarrassment and ridicule on some level. And all of that makes the the taste of the mic drop moment that much sweeter. And one way to homes. get closer to that mic drop moment is to achieve the goal of deadlifting 400 pounds. And Vaughn Rawls can help you get there. That's right. I'm working on it. That's right. Brian, tell him about it. <laughs> hey, Brian's like the number one guy right now. I'm uh, I'm working on it. Yeah, I, I bought the program and, uh, you know, I do three three workouts a week. In my past, I was uh, my top deadlift. Uh, my one rep max was 325. But I've I've kind of taken CrossFit's always kind of a come and go thing for me. So I don't I don't focus on it as much as I should. And but you know i'm back in the gym now i'm doing metcons doing strength training and you know i'm really committed to getting to that 400 pound deadlift and i'm about six weeks in i think to the uh, program and my numbers are flying up i uh i'm, I'm definitely seeing results and you know and, and most of the workouts you know probably take me 10 or 15 minutes to do so it's not even like it's a huge uh, time investment to uh to do them but um i'm enjoying seeing the plates at uh be added on to the uh yeah. to the bar pulled 305 for a triple the other day yeah right yeah and consider, cool. considering my one rep max is 325 i'm pretty excited that you know that i was able to lift 305 for three and i had more in me you know I, but that's just where i decided to kind of max out for that day so i keep watching your numbers go up and i think wow, that's amazing. And then I'm like, I bet the reason for that is because he does the program. <laughs> <laughs> I actually see him in here like three days a week doing I mean, the program. I've been uh, looking at the program for several weeks and nothing's happened. That's right. I it looks it. really good. It looks really good. So I, I, guess I skipped doing those it. other two workouts and I did this one and my number didn't go up. I'm not sure why. Can, can you? <laughs> yeah, I did the one that I really like. <laughs> I tell you what will is guaranteed, take my word for it, to add at least 10 pounds to your deadlift. Reviewing us on iTunes. <laughs> With five stars. With five stars. Yeah, one star will throw your back out. Reviewing us with five stars will, will guarantee you a PR. I finally figured out how to read the reviews the other day, and th those, were, those were really good. So thanks to everybody that's written those so far. It means a great deal. It really does. Remember, you can find us at Lift Run Long on Twitter and Instagram. We want to thank uh, Ted Horrell and the Monday Night Card for the for our bumper music. Everyone have a wonderful day. Thanks, y'all. All right. I'm so tired of all the things I say to myself.